Close your eyes and take a deep breath with me in and out of your mouth. Okay, you can sit down. That was more for me than for the ladies. Why do we serve? Of course, our first thought is that it is inherently good to be of service. That what we offer of ourselves makes a positive impact on someone's life. We feel good about ourselves, or at least better. In some cases, we serve to fulfill a certain number of hours. In other cases, we serve because we might want to travel. In all cases, we serve because of some impetus related to the self, as with all decisions we've ever made. In David Foster Wallace's address to the 2005 graduates of Kenyon College, he remarked on the innate tendencies of human self-centeredness when he said, everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and important person in existence. We rarely talk about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive but it's pretty much the same for all of us deep down. It is our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There's no experience you've had that you are not the absolute center of. The world as you experience it is right there in front of you, or behind you, to the left or right of you, on your TV, or your monitor, or whatever. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, and real. When we are of service, we attempt to temporarily step out of this hardwired self-centeredness and into mindfulness. When we do this, we can come face to face with the reality that perhaps contrasts the comfortable, sheltered reality we lead. These can be painful experiences that take days, weeks, or even years of reflecting to process. I'm still reflecting on my own experiences of service, specifically those that can be equated to our Kentucky trip. Two years ago, I spent two months in LaPlante, South Dakota, on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation as an intern volunteer, managing their community garden, and assisting with the daily summer camp, and cooking meals for weekly volunteer groups that came to build homes and drive the camp. You may remember a representative from the nonprofit Simply Smiles who came to speak at Assembly last year. And you may also remember Grace and Billy who were calling their time volunteering there as well. I'm still processing what my time as a volunteer on the reservation then. While I feel that the summer camp for the children in that Lakota community was the highlight of some children's days, and that our community meals, garden workshops, and evening softball games were jovial distractions from difficult or sometimes toxic home lives, I still contemplate the impact of my presence there. I came, I helped, and I left. So did others, and so will others. I learned more about a culture and history than I could ever repay by gardening, cooking meals, building a home, or playing a game of basketball. Ivan Illich, a philosopher, a Roman Catholic priest, and critic of general westernized culture, addressed the conference on inter-American student projects in Cuernavaca, Mexico in 1968. In this speech later titled, To Hell with Good Intentions, Illich partially criticized the white middle-class college students who were preparing to live in small villages in Mexico for months at a time as volunteers. I will read to you an excerpt from this speech now. The idea that every American has something to give and at all times may, can, and should give it explains why it occurred to students that they could help Mexicans develop by spending a few months in their villages. It is now high time to cure yourselves of this. You, like the values you carry, are the products of an American society of achievers and consumers with its two-party system, its universal schooling, and its family car affluence. You are ultimately, consciously or unconsciously, salesmen for a delusive ballot in the ideas of democracy, equal opportunity, and free enterprise among people who have the possibility of profiting from these. Next to money and guns, the third largest North American export is the U.S. idealist, who turns up in every theater of the world. The teacher, the volunteer, the missionary, the community organizer, and the economic developer, the vacationing do-gooder. Ideally, these people define their role as service. It is profoundly damaging to yourselves when you define something that you want to do as good a sacrifice and help. Whoa. Illich clearly did not concern himself with diplomacy in this address. Now, of course, this sort of voluntourism, as they call it, completely contrasts the community service that we partake in here at Westover in Connecticut. Think of your participation in community service at Westover as individual, meaningful patches that contribute to the ornate fabric of our local community. Illich speaks to someone like myself, who moved on to college and in a place of privilege, traveled to communities that I was not a member of to do good. So why do I share this? 
because you may find yourself, as I did, taking your meaningful experiences from community service at West River in this local community and moving on to larger and longer term commitments of service. I share this not to discourage you from participating in community service of this sort, but rather to encourage you to take the time to reflect deeply when you do. Take the time to consider that you receive just as much as you give. You give three hours of sorting food at the food bank, and you receive the understanding of how families rely on meals provided by this service. You serve dinner at the shelter on Wednesdays, seeing some of the same faces you saw last term or last year, and you learn that homelessness is cyclical and can attract youth in institutionalized cages for years, and it can happen to anyone. You give an afternoon of harvesting produce at the Abbey of Regina Laudis, and you learn that your stereotypes of these benedictine women are completely wrong and that their character, passion, and lives are as complex and visceral as wrong. Your service is always repaid to you with interest in your own enlightenment. Lastly, I want to digress from the false notion that all those who miss are different than us. It is entirely possible, and even likely, that there is not a difference between those you are serving and yourself. Perhaps you share the same city, neighborhood, school, socioeconomic, socioeconomic standing, traditions, culture, or space. Perhaps you can fully empathize or identify with those you serve, and as a result, you work in solidarity. Maybe it isn't service at all, but work for justice and equity. Whatever your work may be, remain mindful that your community service can be best framed as service learning, for you too are reaping the benefits of the experience as you listen, hurt, yearn, rejoice, reflect, and grow. As the Jesuits say, your service will leave you ruined for life no longer sheltered to or blind from the injustices of this world. And to end, I'd like to repeat the quotation by Lilla Watson, an indigenous Australian artist and activist in Africa. Her words dictate my assumptions prior to and my reflections beyond my experiences of service. If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. If you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together.
40 children that ask with only innocent curiosity in their eyes, do you sleep in a bed or a bathtub? 40 children that ask, can I come home with you? But more importantly, these are 40 children that are still affected when we leave. Will their sadness erase the good memories of the past week, or does it empower them? Will I allow them to empower me? Will they only remember us leaving them, not our time spent together? Can I feel that loss and still be determined to keep helping others? Will they even care at all or be able to see outside of their world after we leave? On a broader scale, what exactly can a dozen high school girls do to try to improve the lives of children with whom we have contact with for not even a week? Is it only my own sense of accomplishment that drives my desire to do community service? What can I learn from helping and listening to others in need? I ask myself, I ask myself those last questions often when I return from the service trip or outing. Who am I really helping? The people whom we assist have had others aid them in the past and will undoubtedly have people assist them in the future. To put it plainly, most of the time, there will be someone else to assist if we are not there. That is the compassion within a society. That said, I must not discredit those who take the initiative and pave the way for others. I can only say that my own reason for continuing to do community service is to remind myself to be present. When I step into the space of another person's life, I try to leave my own worries and problems behind and recognize my privilege. I do not think of the people I am spending time with as only one or 10 or 40 out of 45 million. They are not numbers. There are people with feelings who are struggling with being able to validate themselves because of statistics. They are, Je they are Levi, Jessalyn, and Jake. They are building with Legos at Brass City Charter School and hot afternoons playing tag in Kentucky. I can only hope that they remember happy memories that they think of me and that people can begin to understand the fact that selflessly caring about and connecting with another person is as possible as it is powerful. Thank you. some of these kids have difficult home lives. And over time, I came to realize this harsh reality. I was there spending time with a young boy, one who had been held back for disruption issues. I spent quite a bit of time with him, because as soon as I would arrive, he would rush over and grab my arm. In a conversation one day, he asked me, can you be my parent? Now naturally, as a 17-year-old girl, I was a little taken aback. I asked why he would want me to be his parent, and explained that I was just simply too young. He replied with, my mommy doesn't like me and my daddy isn't around. And this was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever had to hear. I don't think we fully understand the causes and effects that neglect can have on children. Now, neglect can be a result of parents working so much that they have lack of time for their kids, a result of different types of substances abuse, and even a result of untreated mental illness. And honestly, the list is just endless. And my heart broke for him as I realized that spending time at school and hanging out with me was possibly a highlight of his week. And at first I felt so insignificant when I volunteered at BCCS because I thought I was just playing with kids and that I was sort of useless. Now, but after that experience, I realized how much of an impact I could have on just a kid growing up. I realized that in a way, he looked at me as a role model and as a result, I became more conscious of my actions and chose to be a little more careful of what I may do. I now know that down the road in life, I want to pursue work in a nonprofit or even work with children. And community service has taught me that every action can have an effect on myself and those I serve, whether we realize it or not. Today I'd love to share a couple of my favorite stories 
about some of the countless beautiful souls that I've had the privilege to meet as part of the Westover Community Service team. I've been continually inspired by the open and loving nature of everyone that we've met during our time in the community. My favorite place to volunteer has always been Little Bridges, a therapeutic horseback riding organization that works with children and young adults with special needs. If you've never heard of therapeutic horseback riding, its purpose is to contribute positively to the cognitive, physical, emotional, and social well-being of individuals with special needs. I met so many amazing and inspiring children during my time at Little Bridges, but a particular child named Kevin will remain in my heart. My first year at Little Bridges, he was very sweet and could always get us all laughing, but he would often struggle focusing and staying motivated to complete the tasks at hand. When I returned the next year, Kevin had made such an incredible amount of progress that he was now one of the best riders at Little Bridges. Kevin had the confidence and discipline of a professional while maintaining his charming personality. Kevin's humor and love of life was simply contagious, while his positive positivity and dedication always left me smiling after every lesson. Another beautiful soul I met during my time at Little Bridges is Alice, the head coach. Alice took the tough love approach to working with the riders, but she had the biggest heart and every rider knew that Alice had their back. She pushed every child to accomplish their goals while helping them gain confidence and determination. Alice knew that the deeper purpose of therapeutic horseback riding was not learning how to hold the reins, reins in the right place or put, put your foot in the stirrup at the right angle, but instead helping these children realize that they're not limited or confined in any way by their disability and that with spirit and tenacity, they have so much more potential than what society may try to tell them. Finally, I want to mention Christopher Sweeney's dedication to community service and how he has not only touched so many lives during his time as the community service director, but also how he has inspired so many West River girls to understand the meaning of community service, and most importantly, to put our whole self into what we do. Christopher never missed a Wednesday team service outing, a day at Little Bridges, a chance to pick up trash in Woodbury, or any other community service tradition. Christopher not only attended all of these trips, but he remained completely and totally present in the moment, connecting on a deeper level with every community he worked with, which I think was one of the best trait is one of the best traits to have because he has taught me that being president, pre president, <laughs> being president is really what service is all about. I would also like to thank Jill, who, ha um, who is the new community service team leader this year, for really pushing us all to think critically about our individual impact on the communities we serve and how we can stay humble. My time as part of the West River Community Service Team has definitely been one of my favorite parts of my time here, and the people I've met will most definitely remain in my heart forever. reflection 
is infinite. I love that description of the net of the god Indra. The universe as an enormous web woven of innumerable strands of thread. And in every place where thread crosses thread, a jewel. And every jewel with its countless facets, perfectly reflecting every other jewel, which in turn perfectly reflects every other jewel. Every jewel taking its luster from all the others, every jewel giving its luster to all the others. In Indra's net, all elements are interconnected and interdependent. Whatever happens to any jewel affects them all. If even one jewel should fall off of the net, or if one jewel should be tarnished, every other jewel will glitter that much less brightly. Any disturbance in one area of the net initiates a ripple effect that makes a difference, however subtle, in all the other parts of the net. And so it is with us. Every human life is a jewel, and every jewel reflects every other. As one American Buddhist teacher wrote of Indra's net a few years ago, on a human level, this principle means that my little daughters will not sleep safely in their beds if children in Syria or Sudan are not safe in theirs. Every jewel reflects every other. I would add that this principle means as well that however much we may have to eat, as long as we are human and not inhuman, we will always be hungry while we live in a world in which about one million children die every year from severe acute malnutrition. It's unlikely to be physical, this hunger of ours. It may not be a hunger we're even aware of, but it will gnaw at our spirit just the same. And living as we do in a world in which 130 million girls of school age are not in school, and so are particularly vulnerable to HIV AIDS, to sexual exploitation and child trafficking, to poverty and hunger, because we share their humanity, we share their plight, no matter that we are all fortunate enough to be at school, and not just any school, but this one. And because we live in a world in which dozens of armed conflicts cost tens of thousands of life every year, as long as we are human and not inhuman, our own lives will not be peaceful. Again, the violence we experience may not be physical, but because we are human, we will suffer in our spirit on account of the suffering of the victims of the war. We live in a country in which the richest 100 uh, individuals have a greater share of wealth than the poorest 40 million households. And in a state with the highest per capita income in the nation, but with a capital city which ranks second of all cities in the nation in urban poverty. However comfortably we may live, we will live poorly as long as that kind of inequity and injustice persists. In Dr. Martin Luther King's words, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. That's the lesson of Indra's net. Every life is a jewel, and every jewel reflects every other. Now for the good news. Every life is a jewel, and every jewel reflects every other. Just as any disturbance in one area of the net is felt in all the other parts, in the same way, any single local act of net mending will make a difference throughout the net. 
and when the smallest bit of tarnish is removed from any of the jewels in the net, all of the jewels glitter more brightly. Which means that your caring act affects the whole global web of interconnected and interdependent lives that is our world. So, if you ever find yourself asking yourself this question, when we spend a little evening time in Waterbury serving supper to men who have no homes, or when we buy a bracelet to raise funds for a battered women's shelter, or travel to Wallingford to sort food donations, or staff the canteen at a Red Cross blood drive, or write a pen pal letter to a first grader at Brass City Charter School, or plunge into wintry waters for a sports program for people with disabilities, or walk beside a horse and rider at Little Bridges, are we really making the world a better place? Here's your answer. Yes.